stbc.org. All right, uh, Romans chapter 10. We stopped at verse 13 last time. So let's begin reading verse 14, 15, and 16. Starting with verse 14 together. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not heard believe? And how shall they believe on him whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them which bring peaceful peace and bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel, for as Isaiah said, Lord, who hath believed our report? Right, verse 14. Remember it talks about in verse 13, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be, be saved. And so the question is asked in verse 14, several questions. What's the first question that's asked? How shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? How shall they call him that have not believed? Uh, what does it mean to call in that sense? Salvation. Probably call for salvation. Ask. Maybe ask and so on, be seasoned. Uh, you can't call on someone you haven't believed. In other words, if somebody doesn't believe that God is in existence, would they want to call upon him? No. No. If they don't believe that Jesus exists, would they want to call upon him? No. So if you have to you have to be sure he's there before you call. In other words, when somebody knocks on the door of a house, uh, if nobody's there and it's a vacant house, does anybody knock on the door? If you know it's vacant, nobody's there. So it's, it's a waste of time trying to call. But if somebody's there and you believe they're there, then you can call, you can certainly call, knock on the door. So that's the first question in verse 14. Uh, what's the second question? How shall they believe in him? And whom they have not heard. Okay, now, if you've never heard of anybody, uh, can you believe that they're, they're in existence? No, you don't. You don't know. You don't nobody know. to ask. Nobody to ask. Nobody to believe. In other words, you have to know that somebody's there, uh, and there, you have to hear of somebody before you can actually believe on him. That's why we take the gospel to the ends of the earth. We have the internet. We have all different types of things. Missionaries. Then, what's the third question in verse 14? How shall they hear without a preacher? How shall they hear without a preacher? What does it mean? What, what does a preacher mean? What does that word mean? Preaches the, preaches the word. <coughs> preaches God, the word. Season yes, pass it in. Some of the heralds the gospel. Some of the heralds the gospel, right? The Kerix is what it is. Kerix has to herald and speak out uh, without a preacher. So, in other words, there's got to be someone to tell them about the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why we send out missionaries. We have five or six or seven that we send uh, from our church, and other churches send them. Uh, are all <coughs> preachers preaching the same thing? No. 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 There's some false preachers and false teachers and teaching false things. Uh, Bill? A lot of times uh, the preachers are saying what's on their heart rather than using the words of God. <coughs> because it seems to me that uh, the Bible verses are what can <coughs> a person. It makes them realize that they are sinners. Mm -hmm. It makes them realize that they need salvation and there's no place else to go. Mm -hmm. So the preachers should be honest preachers and true preachers of the scriptures, yeah. the word of God. And those that are false teachers, they will lead people astray rather than in a straight path, which we've got to be very careful. So we have to have preachers. Then verse 15, what's the next question? And how shall they preach except they be sent? So preachers must be sent, must be commissioned. Now, who should send the preachers? The church. believers. The church only? First of all, the who Lord. should? The Lord. Now, if the Lord has not sent the preacher, should he be sent? No. no. If the, what about if his mother wants him to be a preacher? No. A lot of times, mother said, I'd like you to be a preacher, son. And see, this, that's not the Lord saying. It's got to be the call of the Lord. There's a lot of preachers all over the country, in this country and other countries, never been called to the Lord to preach. They've been, maybe for a big salary, something else. I remember one pastor who was a pastor of many, a big church, and a lot, got a big seminary, and very popular. He gave his testimony how he was called to preach. He got in an automobile accident. His father was a minister. I don't know whether he's even saved, but he called an accident. He fell on the ground and Okay, uh, I'll preach to you because I, I was prepared for this automobile accident. I don't know, but uh, it's got to be a clear call. What are the three things that pastors to be are asked at an ordination council? What are usually the three things? Are you saved? Well, salvation is part of it. Yes, Paul. Uh, the husband could be the, the husband, the husband of one wife. Well, not necessarily. Yeah, Tammy. 
The call to the ministry. The call to the ministry. One of them, isn't it? Salvation, call to the ministry. And then what's the third thing? What's the third thing they discuss before pastors? Is what do you believe? What do you believe? What's your doctrine? Like? Yeah, Bill. Oh, uh, my, my question gets back a little bit further to uh, uh, Daniel's preaching uh, last Sunday night on Samuel's mother. Uh, praying for Samuel to be given to give mm -hmm. him back to God. Yes, it's an interesting prayer, isn't it? Very good. For Samuel. So uh, the preachings must <coughs> be sent unless they be called. And uh, uh, this is an important question. The Lord is rich on the end of call of mine. Uh, and so it must be sent, and the calling must be genuine from the Lord. And then in verse number 15, oh, also, oh, excuse me, I'm sorry. Oh. Oh. I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't, I, oh, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but um, doesn't uh, Jesus also say in his word that many are called, but few are chosen? That's true, many are called, few are chosen. Uh, the, the, the call in the sense of being invited, but people don't accept the invitation. That's, the that, that's a, a different type of call, it's called the two. That's just the wind, the cast. that's just the wind. The wind. That's, that, that's the call in here, isn't it? Yes. All right, uh, in the sense of. Uh, how shall we, yeah, that's difficult. This is the invitation. That's true, the invitation. That's, that's just the wind. That, it's just it's a lot of wind out there, so it makes it. Allegedly, we're getting that fixed. Pardon me? Allegedly. Allegedly, we're trying to get that fixed sometime <laughs> this week. All right. So this is a different type of call. Uh, in verse 15, as it is written. Now, where does the quotation come then in verse 15? Isaiah 52. Isaiah 52, that's right. What does verse... it talk about here? We're in Isaiah 52, verse 7. I read it, Pastor Nick. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publisheth peace, that bringeth good tidings of good, that publisheth salvation, that saith unto Zion, by God reigneth. Uh, this morning we, we quoted this verse and talked about feet. Uh, what else did we say about the feet this morning, if you remember? Their feet are. <coughs> The last verse for 15. Swift to destruction. Shred, shed blood. That's a, a bloody feet. See, but this is beautiful feet. What does that mean, the beautiful feet of them that preach the gospel? How, how is that understood? It's a part for the whole. I'm on a pia, I think it's right. a part for the whole. The feet, mm -hmm. of course, that's just a part of it. The feet what? are attached to a person. What do the feet do? They carry the gospel. They carry the gospel. They just carry the preachers. They carry the, the person that brings the gospel. That's right. And they're beautiful. Why does God call those feet beautiful? beautiful? Because the gospel is the message it now brings. This, this, it brings, and the gospel is, is, is beautiful. Now, what if they have feet that don't preach the gospel? Would they be beautiful feet then? No. no. They're See, regular feet. They're regular feet. Now, there's, there's foreign gospels, right? They're false gospels. Remember in Galatians, Paul says, If any man bring another gospel, let it be accursed. Other gospel that I preached unto you. Christ died for our sins and rose again. This is the gospel. Let's be trust in him as Savior. The beautiful feet of those who preach the gospel of peace. Now, in what sense does the gospel bring peace? What is the gospel, first of all? What gospel means? You're, what is? you're a sinner. Man's a sinner. Good news. Right, man's a sinner. That's part of good news. Man's a sinner. Bad news first. He's a sinner. What else? The second part. Uh, Jesus saves. Jesus saves. He died for your sins. And what, then the third place, what, what part of the gospel? Plan of salvation. Yes, plan of salvation. And what? We must trust him. Must trust him. In other words, the gospel, if it's preached uh, successfully, the people must understand that they must accept the Savior and receive the Savior, believe in the Savior. That's part of the good news, isn't it? The gospel of peace. Now, how does the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ bring peace? That's the answers to life. Answers to life? All right, what else? Peace with God. But what's that verse? Peace, Peace with God. God. Romans 5. Romans 5, 1. Let's all say it. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's what brings us peace with God. Now, if we don't have the gospel, we're justified by faith in Christ. What are the people as far as God is concerned? What's the status? They're lost. They're lost. And they're, they're at war. They're at war. But do they have peace with God? Sure. Not so. No. So by being justified by genuine faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, we can be have peace with God. So the gospel of peace. 
and bring glad tidings of good things. Glad tidings, what does that mean? Good news. Good news again, yeah, fine. I want to talk about feet a little bit. Hey, go ahead. Uh, Take over with your feet. <laughs> some feet aren't the prettiest, but yeah, some feet are very bad, <laughs> ugly feet. Go ahead. Take my feet, Francis Gabriel said, and let them be swift and beautiful for thee. Very good. And uh, uh, we can, uh, I, we may think some things which maybe we shouldn't think, mm -hmm. like go certain places we shouldn't right. be. It's our feet that takes them there because we right. want to go. If we didn't have any feet, we couldn't get there except right. for a wheelchair or something. Yeah. And so sometimes uh, we should think, where are my where are my where are my feet taking me today that they that they cannot glorify God? That's right, Pastor Dan. We control where our feet take us. <laughs> right. Yes. That's true. We control where our feet take us. That's right. right. Um, this is a recollection of when I was re when I was reading. Um, I don't remember why I was. I guess I was looking at it. From a parent, looking at it from the, my Old Testament reading, I was thinking of this. Uh, I don't remember the connection, but it was about M Mary Magdalene and how she was kissing the Lord Jesus' feet. She recognized the gospel, mm -hmm. that's right. and she, you know, she she washed his feet with, with her own tears. tears. That's right. That's good. Very good. Those are the feet. <coughs> uh, very important. Uh, feet must be uh, working in the Lord's will and going where the Lord wants to go. So. Uh, the thoughts must be glorified to the Lord, the words must glorify the Lord, and where we go must glorify. That's where our feet takes us, our cars, whatever it may be. This. So, beautiful feet, uh, then they bring good things. You all right? Everything? Something caught? It's just the flashlight. I'm trying to do something. Oh, something dropped. Okay. Just watch it. Uh, now, we read verse 16 also. Now, what does this negative mean? What is true in verse 16? Read it. Read it. They have not all obeyed. I think we read already. Mm -hmm. yeah. They have not all obeyed this gospel. What does it mean, not obey the gospel? Not to receive it. Not to receive it. Mm -hmm. The Christ died for the sins. Not to receive the fact that they're sinners. Do all people think they're sinners? No. no. What does God say? We are. All the sins. Non righteous. Sins. We said that this morning. Remember, non righteous. Those four Protestant ones. And uh, non righteous. Mm -hmm. But they not all believe the gospel. Uh, they haven't believed that Christ died for their sins. And rose again, and uh, they haven't accepted him, trusted him. Let's say John 3:16 to see what the gospel is. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. A part of the gospel in John 3:16 is the negative: if you reject the gospel, should not perish. Perishing is involved in rejecting the gospel of Christ. Should not perish. The problem is verse 315, many of the Gnostic critical Greek texts leave out perish. It's all just disbelief, but no perishing. 316 they put it in because they don't want to take that out because that's a popular verse. But they have not all believed our report. What does report mean? Testimony of what's happening. Testimony of what's being said, that's right. And that's what Isaiah says. All right, let's go to verse 17. 51, chapter 51. You read it then. Who hath believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? Isaiah 51. Now, some people believe that just because the Lord Jesus Christ died for the sins of the world, that everybody is saved. Is that true or false? It's false. What must occur before the people are saved that Christ died for? They must receive him and believe the Lord Jesus Christ. They must accept that offer. It's a, it's a free offer. It's by grace we're saved through faith, but if we don't accept that offer, it's not ours. We've said many times, if I hold up a piece of paper and say it's a million dollars, it's not a million, but if it were a million, how many people in this room would receive the million? Only those that take it. Only those that come up and take it. See? So I, the offer is one thing. The reception of that offer and the receiving that offer is completely different. Uh, did we read... Yeah, did we read 17, 18, 19? Yeah, after that. 53, not 51. I Pardon me? It's 53, not 51. Well, Isaiah 53. Yeah, 53, not 51. Yeah, 53, 53, not yet, huh? In our fundamentalist class, we learned uh, that the Methodist, Methodist church and all yes. that, they're the ones that evidently uh, 
said that people were off, everybody was saved? Yes, that's Universalism true. or whatever it was called. That's right. Uh, now, did John Wesley believe that? Charles Wesley? No. I don't, I don't think, think so. he did, but then it's, it's apostatized. The Methodist Church is apostatized, and they believe in a universal fatherhood of God. Tam? Uh, an email? Yes. It's from uh, Jim Canada. Hello, and God bless. Um, <coughs> Christ our head has to control our feet. Very good. Just wave to James Canada That's over good. in Massachusetts. Wave to Massachusetts. Thank you, James. Appreciate that. Christ, our, He's, uh, Christ our, our head, must control where our feet go. That's very good. It's the brain that tells us feet to, go, to move around. Let's read 17, 18, and 19 together. <coughs> so then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. But I say, have they not heard? Yea, verily, their sons went out with all the earth, and their words unto the ends of the world. But I say, did not Israel know? First Moses said, I will provoke you to jealousy, and then there are no people, and by a foolish nation, I will anger you. Now, verse 17. Uh, faith. How is this faith come, according to this verse 17? Hearing. Hearing. Hear. What type of hearing? In the Word of God. The Word of God. And now, are different versions of the Bible all equal to the same words? No. no. No, they're all different words. Uh, there's two basic New Testament Greek texts. What are they? The, the received text. The received text. What is that text? What Bible goes along with that text? The King James. The King James Bible. What is the other Greek text? Alexandrian. Alexandrian or named? West Gotten Hort. West or? Nassau Island. Critical. Or critical or Gnostic. All these different words. The United Bible Society. American Bible Society. The United, the United, United Bible Society. All, all these different Greek texts. And uh, uh, are the, what version is going on with that text? All the modern versions. The modern versions, okay. There's only one that doesn't, but all the modern versions except that one. Yes, Vaughn? Well, what is the text that begins with M? I forget. Majority text. Yeah, which is sort of... Uh, what is the majority text? Oh, that's good. That's good to bring up. What is the majority? That's popular nowadays. What's popular? What, what does that do with the text receptors? Correct. How many changes is that in that? I don't remember. Well, over 1,500, 1,800 changes in the text receptor. Pastor Dan, you got something back there? No, nothing right now. Oh, that's right now. Okay. So, see, some majority of things. See, the text receptor has everything that's in the King James Bible. We translate it from the received text. But the majority text says no. 1,500 or 1,800, depends on who counts it, change the text receptor. That's the majority text. <laughs> but why did they do that? Well, they think it's got better Greek authority. See? It's what? They say it's better Greek authority, better Greek text. How many different majority texts are there? Three. Three. Name them. Okay. Pierpont. 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 Robinson and Pierpont is one. The first one before that was? Uh, the one uh, Hodges does. Hodges and Farstad. What's the third? Pickering. 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 Norman, Wilbur Pickering. Wilbur Pickering. He's got Wilbur a third Pick one. Oh, that's a new Wilbur one. Wilbur Pickering. That's a new one. See, three of them. Have all those three majority texts agree? No. No. Do any of them agree with the text of receptors? No. Do they, are they sure they even got this correct? That's a solid text. They're sure that they've got the final one. No, they no. still are looking. Horrible. <laughs> they still don't know. Yeah. Uh, John first and then uh, 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 Go ahead. John first and then uh, oh, well, Anthony. The new King James is based text receptus. Uh, yeah, but, but well, it's not, few, not translated properly. But, but, a few, but a few modifications. I found three without any looking at the new, the new King James. A friend of mine has found 100, 150 where they go ahead with the critical text. So it's not pure text receptor. It's closer than the others, but it's not pure New King James. That's right. A Andrew, Alexander. Yeah. I mean, excuse me. They Andrew. make these change, thousand changes <laughs> in the Pardon? original version. Pardon me? You said that they came along and they changed 1,100. 1,500 to 1,800. Now, who authorized those changes? These are people that are for no, no, who the Bible is written by somebody to begin with. Now yeah. King James. Now well, who yeah. authorized those fifteen hundred changes well, the, and approved it? Well, the people that got them out authorized it and approved it. Just those people. What do you the, mean, just regular people? Regular people. The three people. Do they count? No, they don't count. See, that's allowed authorized their majority text. Robinson Pierpont authorized their majority text. And Wilbur Pickering authorized his majority text. All different. They fight among themselves. 
But the text of septus is sound and stained and sensible and stays permanent. Got ten. Could you give a brief, um, brief summary of of how higher um, textual criticism started in the 1800s? Or, I mean, maybe it started before that, but... Mm -hmm. um, yes, the, the textual criticism started in the 1700s, really, but by 1881, when Westcott and Hort were there, their Anglican Church of England people, they decided to have a new translation of the King James Bible. That's what they wanted. They weren't going to change the text, just change a few words. But when they got in there, Bishop Westcott and Professor Hort and several others in that committee said, we're not just going to change the English, we're going to change the Greek text. They've been working on it for 15 or 20 years. Yeah, but who authorized them to do that? They, they themselves. Well, that doesn't but, count. I know it doesn't count, but they themselves <laughs> took it upon themselves, authorized themselves to change the Greek text and the Greek words. Well, anybody yeah. can start changing it today. <laughs> right. Yeah, Bill and then Pastor Dan. Uh, he could use a copy of Defending the King James Bible. That would explain the whole background of it. Yes, yeah, yes. Or, Anthony, you ought to get it. Defending the King James Bible, that's a good book to get a background. Yeah, Pastor Dan. Yeah, there's, I mean, there's 5,000 manuscripts. Over that's 5, right. 5,000 yep. manuscripts, parts yep. or whole manuscripts. And so, I mean, the was saying was textual criticism. Mm -hmm. We're trying to say which which one of these texts is the closest to the original. And so we have the. the mm -hmm. or, or, do I got to finish it later? Get Jacob. Go ahead. I'll finish. Get Jacob. Go ahead. Uh, Rob Winograd from Chicago. Go ahead, Rob. Hi, Pastor. I just want to try and help Anthony understand why they changed it. Originally, the author's original authorization of the King James Bible was by the Anglican Church which was completely separate from Rome, and, and that was in 1611. And 250 years later, around 1870, by that time the Anglican Church had become infiltrated with Roman Catholicism. And uh, <coughs> they, they allowed Roman Catholicism to mix with uh, different parts of the Anglican Church, and there were several parts of the Anglican Church. And the most, one of the most liberal ones was called the Broad Church Movement. And that's who, who Dr. Wade told you about, Westcott and Gort. They were the ones that were not set. First of all, the Catholic Church hated the King James Bible and the underlying text. And they had a couple people that were sympathetic towards that cause in Westcott and Gort. They were, they were, Pretty, they were only Anglicans by name. They were Roman Catholics, and they were authorized by the by the Anglican Church through the Broad Church movement and the Anglican Church to make those changes in there. And it was they had a they had a theological presupposition. They hated the King James Bible. They wanted to get back eventually to the Latin Vulgate. And uh, you can hold up these new Bibles and. They're very similar to the to the uh, Catholic Bibles, to the Dewey Rames Bible, um, and to the Latin Vulgate. But it was it's it's a difference between the Anglican Church and the Roman Catholic Church. Well, who is in charge, the Anglican Church or the Catholic Church? Who is in charge? Who's in charge? Of the the Bible? Church or the Roman the Bible. Catholic? Which church, the Roman Catholic or the Anglican? The Anglican well, the nation, was under, the under heavy Roman Catholic influence. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, okay. it, it, Thanks, is, he, is he saying that the <clears throat> Anglican Church finally had the final say? Uh, the Anglican Church had the say, final say. with the West Mountain Horde Greek text, the false Greek text. All right, thanks, Rob. Let's wave to Rob in Chicago. Pastor Dan had something before the call, and then Bill had something. Go ahead. Wait a minute, I'm going to one of these to Anthony. Okay. Here. That will lay out the the yeah, Pastor Dan, go ahead. So they were trying to, to pick and choose what they thought was better. Yeah. And they, they, they based most most much of the decision, these two men, West Cotton or primarily those those two men were the the, the leaders of this, this this committee when they were revising the uh, Greek text. And the two Greek texts they differ from each other about seven percent of the places. Seven percent. And they not only do we have a difference in Textual variants. We also have a difference in the translation methods and so forth. All right. So that's that's where that's part, of the problem, part of the problems are. Now, yeah, Bill, that book uh, will lay the evidence out for Anthony, both pro and con. Yes. It'll give him the complete evidence there 
so you can actually look at it and weigh each of the facts. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the few words that we're exchanging here right now uh, is just going to be a little confusing. Yes. Until he actually gets into it and looks at the evidence. Right. Now, what? Pat, do you have another question? Uh, no, no, what is, I, I disagree with that because Rob, who's going to be <laughs> our authority on this, said that the Anglican Church approved what the Roman Catholics did. Well, That's what he said. Well, what he, what he said was the Anglican Church in approved. Western Church Day were whole, uh, very influenced by Roman Catholicism. Westcott and Hork loved Rome, and but they themselves in the Anglican Church, so-called, they were phony Anglicans because they weren't really true. They were the broad church, which is a liberal wing of the church, and they approved it, and so they went into yeah, but it. But his initial was that the Anglican Church approved the original Bible. Well, this the no, change, no. the change of the Bible. No, the original no, 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 1611. And then he said that the Roman Catholic change changed 1500 versions and it was approved by the Anglican Church. They either approve it or they disapproved it. According to Rob, they approved it. Well, you, you have the, the English translation and then you have the Greek text. And I think Whatever they approve, it was approved. Yes, you see, the Roman Catholic Church used the Latin Vulgate, the West Latin Hort text used the Greek text critical Gnostic Greek text. So they said, how many differences are in the Gnostic critical Greek text and the text of Receptus and underlies the King James Bible? How many differences? 8,000. How many? 8,000 8, differences. How many of those affect doctrine? 356 places. 8,000 differences. As Pastor Dan said, there are over 5,255 or so manuscripts. Now there's probably 300 more since it was, the count was given way back in the 1960s. But of those 5,500 manuscripts, how many are the basis of the critical Greek text, roughly? About 50. In other words, you've got Vatican and Sinai, and about 43, maybe 45 to 50 out of all the. That's less than 1% of the evidence. And over 99% goes along with the received text that underlies our King James Bible. That's, so that's, that's the, the root of it. That's the root that's of it, the right source. there. I guess. So, in other words, but they have all kinds of wiggly room. To show how that 1% has got to be superior to the 99%. All kinds of a funny way of going about it, all kinds of lies and twisted schemes to show to people, and they believe it. And these people with these new versions believe the Westcott and Hort text. I'm talking about fundamental Bible and Christians like Bob Jones University and many others hold to this funny text. They go right along with the English Standard Version, the New International Version, the New American Standard Version, and so on. All right, so that's a lot on verse number. It's 17. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Yes, John. Uh, there's another Bible that those pieces of text is Receptus. It's a modern translation that's not the well known, the Little Translation Bible by J.B. Green. Mm -hmm. He also had he also put out his and in later too pieces of text Receptus. Have well, you heard of him? Well, J.B. Green, yes, Green. J. Green has been he's been. Uh, what do I call it? He's, he's gone out of business at least twice. The, the senior, Jay Green Sr. and Jay Green Jr. And several things about him. Uh, the, the senior said, now, if you get this at a special price, uh, we'll send it to you. And so I gave that special price to several of the things he offered. He never sent it to me. Uh, he went out of business because a lot of times he didn't tell the truth to Jay Green Sr. So there's a Jay Green study. We have it right there, back there. It's got the whole Old New Testament, J. Green's Old New Testament. But uh, the text he uses in the New Testament uh, is not always, uh, the translation of that text is not always accurate. See, it's, it's got, the, it's got, the, it's got the Greek there, but not the proper uh, translation. Yeah, back to that. I think he calls it King James 2. Yeah, he has a King uh, James 2, that's right. But there's a cross reference in Hebrews 11, 11, 6. But without faith it is impossible to please him. For the cometh that God must believe that he is, and that he is a reward of them that diligently seek him. So cross for Romans for 10, 17. Yes. And so, faith come up by the so J. Green's King James 2 is not the same as King James, so I don't pay much heed to him. The fact of the matter is, if you take an interlinear, J. Green's interlinear, he's got the Greek uh, text that underlines the King James Bible in the actually, actual pages, from the margin. He's got his King James 2, not the King James Bible. He's got a strange thing. It's not to be trusted 
in any way, shape, or form. It's only a one-man translation, and he's not done a good job of many things that he's written. So, yes, Pastor Dan. But from the standpoint of the, the, the from a study aid of the interlinear, if you're cautious, it can be beneficial. The interlinear oh, yeah. aspect of the whole oh, yes. thing, of the Old Testament and the New mm -hmm. Testament, it can be can prove beneficial. It's just to take you to study it with caution. Yes, study with caution. Make you know, sure that the Greek text or Hebrew text are the proper words that should be there. I mean, there's not very many interlinear Bibles out there that are available. That's true. You, know, you have an point. NIV interlinear, New International Interlinear. Don't trust that with a million years. Explain. But they have two that are fairly close. Uh, Jay Green's is one, and he's got the Greek text receptus in his Greek. And the other one is, what's his George name? Berry, George Rickard Berry. George Berry. You can't find it anymore. You can't find it anymore. It's sort of out of print. And that uses the 1550... What's the Stevens, Stevens, Stevens text, the Greek text, which changes about 150, 200 places in text receptus. But it's good if you get a Greek word, don't necessarily trust what's interlinear said, but look it up in a good Greek lexicon and find the meaning of it. So it's helpful in that sense. Yeah, Explain what an interlinear is. Interlinear means the Greek or Hebrew up here, and underneath it is the English translation. <coughs> word for word, English. That's an interlinear. All right. We have the, the Texas receptus set. Don Jr. did. Yes. We have that, uh, that's called the, what's that called? The Doctor of New Testament. The Doctor of New Testament. That gives the exact, uh, in the King James Bible, English, it shows where the West Gun Hoare people have changed it in bold letters and the footnotes. It shows how they change it. Some uh, six, uh, six or seven hundred places where they've changed it right there in the text where you see it. Yes, the Greek yeah. text is a like Scrivener's in annotated Greek New Testament. That it's, the English the Greek. Of the, it's the English of the Greek text. That's the English of the Greek text. All right. Uh, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Uh, is it important which word of God you're looking at to get the faith? For instance, if you had the Gnostic critical Greek text of Romans 1.16, what would that be versus the King James Bible? They delete the word Christos. They delete the word Christos. Uh, which would be the gospel of Christ, which would be Christian. Uh, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God and salvation. But the, not, not the gospel of Christ. Because the Gnostics didn't believe that Christ had any power of all. He, he got that gospel. Everybody was saved as far as the Gnostics. And the Gnostics are people that doctored that. So it's got to be a very important to get the right word of God. Very important. But people that, uh, that we insist that the King James English translation is the right word of God, or the Greek Text receptus is the right word of God. A lot of people think we are what? Intolerant. Intolerant. What else? Legalists. Legalists. What else? What's the question? If we hold to the text receptus that underlies the King James the Greek text solidly, but, and the King James translation of us, what do they think? Fuddy-duddy. Fuddy-duddy. What else? Textual bigots. Textual bigots. What else? Wrong. Wrong. What else? Crazy and wacko. <laughs> crazy and wacko. That's what they think of us. We've had that label for many years. How are we supposed to come up with crazy and wacko? I mean, all these things you said were right. Mm -hmm. I didn't dispute any of them. I just went out with my own. Oh, okay. I just wanted to add to it. Crazy and wacko. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> anyway, but it's very important. Now, it says in one of the scripture verses, uh, <coughs> he that does not record me that, hold to my word and doesn't stand for my word my father will judge me and you'll be just you know, he whosoever is ashamed of me and of my words I'm him with the father be ashamed when he cometh with his holy angels he that's ashamed of me and my words so we can't be ashamed of his words if we believe we have the words of God in the text receptus and the King James Bible and the English now then we should not be ashamed we should stand firm no matter what people think of us Regardless, yes. Okay. I was just thinking, rightly dividing the word of truth is a phrase that really uh, put a lot of responsibility on the translators. Yes, that's right. Uh, First Timothy 2.15. <coughs> All right, uh, so let's go on then. How shall they believe? But by faith and by hearing, hearing by the word of God. So now let me ask this. Just because someone hears the proper words of God and with the gospel message, does that mean he necessarily has faith in it? No. no. What does it mean that faith cometh by hearing? What does that mean? You have to believe it. You have to believe it. You have to hear in their heart. Hear in their heart. And, but the way, they, the way you get the, to, to anchor it. That's by receiving it. What, it. what should be faith's object? 
Truth. Truth. And the word of God, the proper word of God. Faith must have an object. A lot of people have faith in a lot of things. Uh, Will, this morning, we're not here this afternoon, but this morning said, neither truth nor error, uh, if you believe in it, doesn't change it. Doesn't change what's belief, doesn't change it, still belief. Or error, faith in error, faith in truth, it doesn't change the truth of what you believe about it. It's an interesting phrase. But uh, we've got to have an object of our faith, which must be in the scriptures, the words of God. Yes, Paul? Um, Jesus, Jesus also said this word that whether uh, people believe it or not, that uh, uh, you know, uh, God's word will still be true. That's true, whether they believe it or not. God's, uh, well, but God be true, never man a liar. That was, we talked about that this morning. Didn't we? So, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. That's why missionaries all over the world have tried to translate into the language of the people the words of God. Uh, we're having a man first in Indonesia. Uh, his name is Turk. Louis Turk. 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 He's doing his best to translate into the Indonesian language. Words of God. People have done that all around throughout the ministry, throughout different nations of the world, because they want the people to have faith in the very words of God, translate it as accurately as they can. You can't always find an accurate translation, uh, whatever it is, but faith comes by hearing, hearing by the words of God. Then in verse 18, when I say, have they not heard? Has everybody in this world heard the gospel of God? They don't all, listen to all. Even if they have heard, a lot of them don't listen. That's, That's right. right. They don't listen. Have they not heard? Then, verily, it says here in verse 18, their words unto the ends of the earth. In what yes. way? Yes, Pastor Dan. That passage was from Mark 8, 38, you quoted earlier, about mm-hmm. whosoever shall be ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful simple generation of him shall also the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in glory of his Father with the holy angels. Mark, Mark 8, 38. 8, 38, yes. And also in Luke 9.26. Whosoever should be ashamed of me and of my words. But Pastor Dan. Luke 9.26 and Mark uh, 8.38. That's the scripture verse that I was trying to quote. Okay. You should not be ashamed. Quoted. That's the reference. That's the reference I quoted. quoted. That's the reference. I quoted it sort of a haphazard way, but couldn't even remember. All of a sudden I remember. But uh, we should not be ashamed of his words. And if we are, he's going to be ashamed of us. That's important. All right. All uh, right. So they've not all heard. Now let me ask you this: What is the difference between special revelation and general revelation? Special and general. <clears throat> Pastor Dan. Well, in the early the Romans, we have a general revelation where we have the creation of the, of the universe, the creation of the worlds. We can look at we can look at that and we can understand that that removes the excuse from him humanity that there is a, there that they, they can't say they didn't know there was a God. Mm-hmm. That's general it. revelation. That's general revelation. Nature and creation, so they they can see that it's against idolatry things that they make. Here's the thing that God has made. So that's general revelation. It's what is special revelation? Yes, okay. Eh? The, the word of God. The scriptures, the Bible. That's what God gave us. God, the Holy Spirit, through Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek, three languages, gave us His words. Old Testament words, New Testament words. It's called special because God worked through human beings, some 40-some men, mm-hmm. plus or minus, to, to give them the words that he wanted them to put down on paper. Mm-hmm. That's why it's special. Special. You know, That's right. In, in, you know, the holy man of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. That's All right. scripture is given by inspiration of God. Mm-hmm. That's why it's special. It's very special for us to have have God's words in our in our in our hands. Mm-hmm. We, we, all, we, all, we not only have the Hebrew Aramaic and Greek, but we have a, we have a good reliable translation. We we have access right. to. We have access to it, our English Bible. Yes, Tammy. That's interesting. You asked that question because that verse is a quote from Psalm 19:4. It's not interesting because I'm sure it was on purpose, but yeah. And that that's just the general revelation mm-hmm. um, that it's referring to in Psalm 19, verse 4. I right, read it for us. Uh, their line has gone out through. Uh, all the earth and their words to the end of the world, and then hath he set a tabernacle for his son, <coughs> referring to the heavens. Mm-hmm. So God's revelation, general revelation, the creation that he made, all people could see that. And obviously, if they can see the thing that God made, when they make their idols, 
Well, that's completely contrary to what God has revealed to him in a general way. And those that live up to that general way, God somehow will, will get to them some way. So, uh, the... What? Pardon me, Bob? What's the... I don't remember the special relation, special... In general, I don't remember that. But, well, it's just a categorization. But what is the verse for special revelation? Well, for instance, the Lord Jesus tells his disciples in John chapter 16, what did he say? I have yet many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. How be it? When he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you in all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. He will show you things to come. He shall receive of mine. He will glorify me, for he will receive of mine and will show it unto you. So the Lord Jesus says, the Holy Spirit, when he comes, we, I will give him. I will teach John, him the words. John what? This is John 16. John 16, 14 through 16. 16, 16 14. 16 something. 14 through 16. I think. 14 through 16. I don't and so know. the Lord Jesus is going to give the Holy Spirit the words, and the words the Holy Spirit then will give to the writers in the Old New Testament the very words of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the author of all the words of Scripture. Old New Testament. Yes, that, that, General that. Revelation, Romans 1, 4, 120 for people maybe need to be refreshed on it. All right. Um, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so they are without excuse. Yes, that's good. That's the general revelation. 12, 13, and 14. Romans 1. It? it was the other passage was John 12, 13, and 14. John 12, 13, and 14. All right. So you asked the question about special yeah, revelation. Well, I'm all mixed up with these Bible verses. The Bible verse for John, Revelation, Psalm 19, 4, and John, something? That's... Romans. It's, it's in Romans it was used as as a special revelation. Mm -hmm. But in, in Psalm 19, um, which is it's being quoted in, in Romans, it's mm -hmm. being used as general. Okay. All right. So, uh, we, have, we have to be at the right word by hearing by believing and that faith can have it. They've heard, in other words, 18, God has revealed it to them in nature and the world that's created. They're without excuse. They shouldn't be separating or hauling down to idols. Questions at bftdc.org, 856-261-9018. Give us a call or comment. I'd like to hear from you for questions and just say hello. And then in verse 19, uh, did not Israel know? What does that mean? Was Israel given God's revelation? Yes. yes, the Old Testament, all the different things. When Moses received it from the Mount, uh, Mount Sinai, he got all the things that God wanted them to do. Did Israel follow God's revelation? Did they follow his revelation? Sometimes they did, sometimes they didn't. Sometimes they did, sometimes they didn't. What did God do? Because when they didn't follow his revelation, he chastised them. Chastised them, that's right. In fact, uh, uh, when they went into the land of Canaan, what did God want them to do? So do it. So do it, drive out the Canaanites. Did they do drive out all the Canaanites? No. What did he warn about them if they didn't drive them out? They're going to be as what? Bricks in your sides. Bricks in the sides and thorns and thistles and so on. And so uh, they were not always obedient to the words of God. And what did he do with the northern ten tribes because of disobedience? Northern ten tribes of Israel. What did he do? Syrian captivity. What did he do? Syrian captivity. What did he do with the two tribes? Because of, captivity, because of disobedience to the word of God. So these are very important things. Uh, but it says they've heard Israel that he knew. Moses said, I will provoke them to jealousy. What does provoke me? Just to stir up. Uh, so where these, from Deuteronomy 32, 30, 32, 21. They move me to jealousy with that which is not God. They provoke me to anger with their vanities. And I will move them to jealousy with them, those which are not a people. <clears throat> I'll provoke them to anger with a foolish nation. Deuteronomy right. 32, 21. Provoke them to jealousy, stir them up, and uh, bless a nation that is not... For instance, in Assyria, did they know the God of Israel in Assyria? Did the Assyrians know the God of Israel? Not, not in the same way. Not in the same way. They did not reveal it. Uh, did the Babylonians know of the God of Israel? Did God reveal the Babylonians? Nebuchadnezzar. 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 A few of them. Well. But in general, they didn't know, did they? 
just to Israel. And so I'll provoke them to jealousy for them that are no people. Now what does God mean by some people that are no people? They weren't Jews. Not Jews and not, not God's people, so that far as he's concerned, there are no people. Uh, and uh, a foolish nation, by a foolish nation, I will anger you. Foolish nation, for instance, in Babylon, were they pleased with the Babylonian captivity? How long were we in, in Babylon, these two tribes of Judah and Benjamin? How long were they in there? 70 years. 70 years in Babylonian captivity. Do you think they were happy there? No. Plus, no, they were they were provoked and angered by a foolish nation. I think that's what he's talking about there. Let's read verse 20 and 21 together. But as says, is very bold, and said, I was found of them that sought me not. I was made manifest of them, asking not for me. But to Israel, he says, all day long I stretch forth my hands unto a disobedient and gainsaying people. By verse 20, we had it in verse 19 too, or uh, but this word he says, what do we say that is called? What type of transliteration? A transliteration. What does transliteration mean? Carry across, Carry across, letter for letter. In the Old Testament, what is the transliteration for this man's name? The Old Testament, what is the transliteration there? Isaiah. 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 That's letter for letter, letter for letter in Hebrew, Isaiah. But in Greek, Esaias, that's the letter for letter. Now what does, do most of the other, many of the King James versions do with this word Esaias? Bring it over as Isaiah. Bring it over as Isaiah. Uh -huh. They don't transliterate. Uh -huh. So there are many phony King James versions. See, this is a Cambridge edition, it's a true edition, but the phonies, they change a lot of names. Uh -huh. What do they do with Jeremiah's? Make it Jeremiah. Make it Jeremiah. <laughs> Just letter for letter. What do they do with Esaias? Oh, we've already said that. What do they do with Elias? Elijah. Elijah. In other words, uh, someone just the other, the other Sunday, he came to our service. He said, I've got this King James Bible. I said, here it is. He shows me a nice big leather bound. I said, uh, turn please to 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. Okay, he did. What does it say? All scriptures going to be expressed thoroughly. Established all or thoroughly established all good works. And his says thoroughly. What does the King James say? Thoroughly. thoroughly. I say that's one of the ways you can tell whether it's a foreign King James or a real King James. Ours is thoroughly. And they say thoroughly. They change the word. And I told him, I said the same thing is true of Esaias, they changed to Isaiah. He said, Elias, they changed to Elijah. And the Jeremiah to the Jeremiah. See, they, they take the, why can the people in this country who publish these books, whether it's Zondervan or uh, Moody Press or uh, one of the other presses. Thomas Nelson. Thomas Nelson. How can they do that and change the King James Bible in this country? Can they do it in England? No. No. See, it's, it's called cum privilegio. It's what it's called with Latin, with privilege. Cum privilegio, which is similar to our copyright. And the, the Cambridge University Press and Oxford University Press were given strict orders. You don't change a word of that. See, it's copyrighted. And so they went over this country. And will you copyright it here? No. We don't care about what you do in England. We don't tear it apart any, any way we want. And that's what we have in the publishers today of our King James Bible. They don't care what the real King James is. That's not. Why is it that here in America the King James Bible was never copyrighted? The people who publish it didn't want to copyright it. They didn't want They want to be able to do whatever. They want to make all the changes they wish to make. <laughs> anyway, I just point that out for you. He says, very bold. What does bold mean? Dare. Forceful, daring. All right. And said, I was found of them that sought me not. What does that mean? I was found of them that sought me not. Who made the first move here? Who made the first move? He did. I, I was proud of them who sought me not. He the did Lord, it on his own. He didn't he did. ask for any help. The Lord himself made the move. He was proud of them that sought me not. Uh, so they didn't seek him, but the Lord found him. I was made manifest to them that asked not after me. Made manifest means what? 
clearly. Short clearly? All right, short clearly. Uh, them that ask not happen. In other words, the Lord just spoke up and revealed himself to these people. Uh, it's like the Lord Jesus Christ showed himself coming to this earth and was perfect God, perfect man, and told the gospel message to the people. Did they all receive it? But if you did, it's after that. It's when Isaiah 65, 1, here in this verse 20. All right, go ahead. I am sought of them that asked me for me. I am found of them that sought me not. I said, Behold me, behold me unto a nation that was not called by my name. All right, good. So now when God first started with Israel, the nation of Israel, the Jews, what were they like? It says in Ezekiel what happened to them. What, what were they like? Insane, disobedient people. Disobedient people, just an ordinary people. Uh, from what country, what nation was Abraham originally? Ur of the Chaldees. Ur of the Chaldees. He's Ur of the Chaldees. And what did God tell him to do? To go to the land of the... I go to a place, he didn't know anything about the place, go where I tell you, did Abraham obey? Yes, he didn't know exactly, but the Lord led him, and he came and uh, he promised him that he would give them this land of Canaan. How many years, but not immediately, how many years did the Jewish people wait to get the land of Canaan for their own? Roughly. 400. About 400 years. See? And why did God say, not now? What was his reasoning? Iniquity. The iniquity of the Amorites. The iniquity of the Amorites was not yet full. God patiently waited for the Amorite sins and wickedness to be completely full. Then he could use the Israelites to judge those people for the Lord. And so that's, so God, uh, uh, he, he, he didn't, they didn't seek after him, but he, he took them up. The book of, of Ezekiel tells about Israel. He says, I got them, and they were just little babies. Remember? Little babies. I, I coddled them and so on and so forth. Little, little tiny babies. I brought them out of heathenism. I made them mine. See, it's a picture of a child being taken over by the Lord. And uh, so this is what happened. They didn't ask after me, but the Lord chose them by his grace. All day, now verse 21, said to Israel, all day long have I stretched forth my hands. What does it mean, stretching forth the hands? What's that they wanted to get some agreement. Uh, I right, stretch for it. It's an invitation. Reach invitation, over. reach over. Now, there's there's two different meanings, different kind of the context that God stretches forth his hands. Sometimes like this, sometimes something else. Yeah, that's sometimes right. it can also refer to judgment, I believe. That's right. Stretch forth his hands to judge, to slap him down. But in this case, stretch forth that pleading with him. Sometimes it's the closed hand, sometimes it's the open hand. <laughs> Yes, Mom? Sam, when a little baby is walking, learn to walk, you stretch forth your hand. Yes, you stretch forth. So it depends on the context. This way, you stretch forth his hand. What kind of a people did he stretch forth his hands to in verse 21? Disobedient and gainsaving people. What does disobedient mean? Doesn't listen. Doesn't listen? Doesn't obey. Doesn't obey. What does gainsaying mean? They want to get everything on their side without right. giving up anything. Yes, what say what? Bad mouthing. Bad mouthing, contradicting, gainsaying. Others disobeyed. Others didn't want to hear what God had to say to them. Are there people today that don't want to hear what God says to them today? Yes. A lot of people. Yes. They don't want to hear. They don't care. And uh, but should that stop us from trying to spread the gospel of Christ to them? No. No. no we go ahead and we tell them. Are we responsible for their actions after we tell them the gospel? No. No, we're not. We're not responsible. It's up to them to make the decision to be trusting Christ. Mm -hmm. But we can still offer it to them. Uh, what did the Lord say in Matthew 11, 28? Come unto me, oh, all yeah. you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take, Take my yoke upon you and learn, learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my, my yoke is easy, is easy and my burden is light. light. So this is what the invitation was to all regards. Any other comments or questions on chapter 10 before we move on a few verses in chapter 11? Okay, let's read 11, 1, 2, and 3 until the tape goes off. Starting with verse 1. I say then, as God cast away his people, God forbid. For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God hath not cast away his people, which he foreknew. 
What do you not, what the scripture saith of Elias, how he maketh intercession to God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed thy prophets, and dig down their altars, and I am left alone, and they seek my life. All right, verse number one. I said, hath God cast away his people? What does that mean? Has he condemned them? Has he scattered them? What are his people here? What's that mean? His people. The Jews. Jews. Now, some people teach what? What is that? What is it called? Replacement theology. Replacement theology. What does that mean? The church church replaces Israel. The church replaces Israel. Mm -hmm. Therefore, as far as Israel is no more. Mm -hmm. This is crazy. Does God have a future for the people of Israel? Yes. Yes, Yes, he does. It's clear in Scripture. Very clear. But the replacement theology says no. All of Israel, the promised Israel, are fulfilled in the church. Absolutely wrong. Bill? There's also a belief going around that uh, the Jews do not need Jesus Christ, that they have a special covenant with God, and uh, they, they do not, not since uh, the cross. That's right. One of the men who's a leader of that, what's his name? He's John Hagee. Yeah. John Hagee. John Hagee heretically says the Jews are saved. Yeah. He goes to speak with many Israelite people, never tells them the gospel. He thinks they're already saved, see? He also, terrible. he also has rabbis in his church preaching. <laughs> is that right? See, this is very seriously wrong. Now, just because they're of Israel doesn't mean they're saved. They've got to trust Christ. Was Paul saved because he was an Israelite? Yeah. No. Why was he saved? Because he, the Lord. he trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as a Savior. Was Peter saved because he was an Israelite? Yeah. What happened to him? Same thing. He Same trusted thing. Christ as Savior. And all these, John and all the apostles. Yeah, Bill? Christ said, uh, none uh, can go to the Father but by me. That's right. No man come to the Father but by me. John 14, 6, let's say, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man come to the Father but by me. Absolutely, only through him we go. Now, remember we said the other day, the other week, that there are three different tenses in Romans, 9, 10, 11. What were the tenses? Past, present, and future. Past, present, and future. And what's chapter 9? Past. Past. For chapter 10. For chapter 11. So those are the future. Now we're in 11 now. That's the future of Israel. So the question is asked, has God cast away his people? In other words, are we finished with Israel? Are we finished with the Jews? A lot of these heretics are teaching that he's finished with the Jews. But does Paul agree with them or disagree with them? He disagrees with them, absolutely. God forbid. Now what do we say about God forbid? May it never be. That's the Greek word, may it never, never, never be. And this is the translation, this is what the, in 1611, that was the phrase, never, never happens. God forbid, may God forbid this thing. And so even though it may not be in the Greek, there it is. Uh, it's a translation. What does Paul say about himself? He's an Israel. Israel. Now, if God threw away the Israelites, what would that do to Paul? Throw him out too. Throw him out too. So cast them through the people here. I'm an Israelite. You can't do that. Uh, what was his pedigree? He brings the seed of Abraham. Seed of Abraham. And what the tribe? tribe of Benjamin? How many tribes were there? Twelve. 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 Okay. Now, which tribe was split? Two sons of Joseph. Joseph's tribe. Joseph and Manasseh. Joseph's tribe. Ephraim and Manasseh were split. Uh-huh. And then, of course, we had the Levites. So we had the twelve <clears throat> general tribes. Uh, Eleven plus Levites. But the one tribe was split into Ephraim and Manasseh. Yeah, Mom? How come Paul could know what tribe he was, but mostly Jews today don't know what tribe they're in? Well, it was 2,000 years ago. Oh, yeah. yeah, 2,000 years ago. And even today, some people say there's a, a DNA that will classify them, and so they'll know during the tribulation period. Who knows? Uh, who knows? Yeah. Oh, Anna, I'm sorry. Oh, Anna knows. Right. No. <laughs> Sometimes you have Cohen's, and like Cohen. I th- well, I think, doesn't the name indicate sometimes which tribe the name could indicate that they're Levites? Yeah, sounds like that. That's right, like a priest or a Levite. Mm-hmm. So uh, we, we don't know the details, but uh, God's going to find them out right. in the tribulation. How many of each tribe are going to be evangelists and saved? 12,000. 12,000 of each tribe. 12,000 times 12 is how many? 144,000. Now, we can't explain and understand how God can save all these different people, but he miraculously can do anything. He can do anything. He's, he's absolutely yeah. omnipotent, but he will do it, uh-huh. as it says in the book of Revelation. During the seven-year tribulation upon this earth, you'll have these evangelists that will go forth and say, he hasn't cast them off. He's tried. Now, he hasn't, whoops, 
Yeah. We'll stop right here at verse 1. We'll pick it up next week. But do you have any other comments or questions before we go? Yes, Lon? Uh, come to the Gospel of John class on Tuesday at, uh, what's the time? 4.30 to 5.30. 4.30 to 5.30, Gospel of work, John. Just come here. That's good. Come right here. And also, be sure to tune in if you can, if you can't come personally, to the History of Fundamentalism class from 3 to 4.30, right here. Yeah, Bible. Fridays. What is that, huh? Fridays. On Friday. Yeah, Friday, 3 to 4.30. And Tuesdays, the Gospel of John, from 4.30 to 5.30. Thursdays at 8 p.m. Thursdays at 8 p.m. for Bible school. And we would have a John's father, David Warren, with his horn. It's such a blessing. Yeah. And he's going to be with us every Yes, it is. Every Thursday night, just the wonderful talent he's got. He either brings his trumpet or his trombone or his baritone. baritone. All these, he's, he's a master of these instruments. Mm -hmm. Any other comments or questions for the call? Baritone what? What kind of instrument? Uh, it's brass, like, brass instrument. Saxophone. You don't know the baritone with brass. It's a brass with a big one. Tuba? No, it's a brass. It's smaller than a tuba. It's a micro tuba. It's a micro tuba. It's a huge. It's a it's tuba is huge. This is a smaller one, about this size. English horn. Like an English horn, all bigger. It's got a name. Well, that's baritone. It's called a baritone, yeah. Uh, it's a baritone, a baritone what? Well, I don't know. It's a baritone. It's all he calls it a baritone. Our well, baritone is the sound that comes out. Well, but it's called a baritone horn. Yeah, I got a baritone sax, an alto sax. Yeah, so this is a baritone uh, horn. It's a Our horn. Side yeah. Yeah. It's it's a brass uh, classical musicians define some of these instruments a little differently. If yeah. you go to a school where they don't teach classical music, they teach popular music mm -hmm. instead, then you're going to come up with a name like that, baritone. Uh -huh. I had a, a friend that I worked with uh, at another at a store, mm -hmm. and uh, she played the baritone. And I kept saying, "Well, what baritone? What?" Uh -huh. uh, bar <laughs> and I kept it digging at it, yeah. and she couldn't give me an answer on that. Yeah. Uh, but then insane. you have to go to the music uh, dictionary, and you look at the pictures. Uh, it's an English horn. English horn. Okay. Yeah, that's what the classical musicians call it. I see. English horns too. That's another instrument. Another English instrument. horn. Yeah. Any any other comments or questions before? We get? John. Uh, a real good music school uh, is Eastman, where Dr. Garlock went to. Have you ever heard really of Eastman? Really good what? Eastman. What kind of school? Music school. Eastman, Eastman Music School. Music school. Music school. Music. Have you heard that one? Never heard that one. Oh, I'm sure you have. Eastman Music School. Eastman. I don't remember. Yeah, is that the first. name he's saying? Yeah. Eastman. That's Eastman. usually films. Coda. Music school. <laughs> Any other comments or questions before we close? Well, let's close in. Our Father, we thank you for thy grace. We thank you for Paul, this letter that he's, the God has given it to him, the Book of Romans. Guide us and direct us as we think through these many verses. Help us next week. Help us on Thursday Bible study as we come and study also the Book of Acts. For with us, those of us who are genuinely saved here this afternoon, to honor thy Son, the Lord Jesus, and live for him to please him. Protect us by thy might. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Amen. Amen.